This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a customer booking an adventure holiday. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Adventure Holiday, how may I help you? Hi, I'm interested in your adventure holidays. OK then, I just need to take down some details. First, your name. Taylor, Paul Taylor. Taylor, and do you live here in London? Uh, yes, I do. 42 South Road, SW1. And your phone number? I'll give you my mobile. It's 137-4259-8686. And your passport number? Oh, just a minute. I have to find it. Here it is. It's uh, 0346... Oh, sorry. Sorry, that's the wrong number. It's... Zero four six four one six seven nine nine. Oh, sorry, nine two. Zero four six four one six seven nine nine two. No, it's zero four six four one six seven nine two. Okay, that's fine. And the expiry date? December two thousand and nine. You said you visited India last year. Yes, that's correct. Did you have any vaccinations? Vaccinations? You know, injections against disease. Oh, yes, I did. Let me see now. I had tetanus, polio. Oh, sorry, no, I didn't have a tetanus injection. I didn't need one. I didn't have malaria either, although I think I should have. I had hepatitis, though. OK, that's fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, which holiday tour are you interested in? South America, Southeast Asia or India? As I said, I went to India last year, so I'd like to try somewhere different this year. Maybe Southeast Asia. I haven't been there before. Asia. OK. And when are you interested in going? I was thinking about maybe June or July. Would that be possible? Not for Asia, I'm afraid. Although we do have an Indian tour those months. If it's Asia you're interested in, then really you're looking at April to May or August and September. May isn't possible because I'm too busy with my job. 
Can you put me down for August and September, please? And would you like the six-week tour or the eight-week? How much is the eight-week tour? It's six hundred and fifty pounds for the six-week tour and eight hundred and fifty pounds for the eight-week. I'll take the eight-week. By the way, what kind of activities are available? Actually, there's quite a range of activities to choose from. We've got things like bungee jumping, white water rafting, and hiking. Hiking? I haven't been hiking for a while. I'm not into bungee jumping, though. I really don't like heights very much. White water rafting sounds okay, though. There's also mountain biking and a jungle trek if you're interested. I tell you what, put me down for the jungle trek and white water rafting. Okay, no problem. But do you have a first aid kit? A first aid kit? Yes, it's important that you take one with you. You have to be careful of insect bites and injuries. It's the climate, you see. Even a small wound can easily become infected. You will also need to take some strong walking boots and long trousers for the jungle trek. Would jeans be suitable? Yes, jeans are a good choice. Other than that, you just need some warm weather clothes. You know, shorts and t-shirts. That's great. And where's the meeting point? Everyone will meet in Bangkok. But don't worry, I'll send you all the relevant details within the next few days. That's great. I look forward to receiving them. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a speech given by an official on the open day of a new alternative health club. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning and welcome to the open day of our new alternative health club here at Chelsea Bridge. I have to say it is very pleasant to have so many people turn up. My name is Harry Wilkinson and I work as one of the nine permanent staff members employed here at the club. The main aim of the open day is to give you a quick tour of the building, but before we do that, I'd like to introduce you to a few people employed at the club. Not all of us are here at the same time. In case you need to contact any of us, 
Our contact details are here on the notice board below the photographs. First of all, this is Sean Bond, who is the technical manager, and his job is to supervise equipment like computers and all the electrical equipment. And this is Margaret Lloyd. Her main function is to oversee training. And she is therefore in charge of all the full and part-time therapists. The next important person I need to introduce you to is James Todd. He is our liaison officer. What he does is to manage bookings for the club rooms and equipment as they are open to different organizations, from the local college to corporate clients like banks and so on. Last but not least is our physiotherapist Edward Marks, who works part-time Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Edward plays an important part in the life of the club. His main role is to prevent injuries. Before you hear the rest of the speech, you will have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now for the various amenities. You see that the club has quite a large capacity and is arranged over three floors. There is a lift by the reception and the stairs. On the ground floor there are two large halls which are used for yoga, tai chi, pilates, and dance and fitness classes for different age groups, with the shop and cafeteria over here. On the first floor we have a full range of fitness machines, which are available in the large central hall, around which there are various offices. The changing rooms are also on this floor. On the second floor there is a series of small therapy rooms with waiting areas for clients. These may be booked by individual therapists. There are also three classrooms which are used for teacher training and group therapy classes. We have a very extensive therapy training program accredited to the University of Manwich with training in counselling, for which we have three programs at the moment. As regards the various types of yoga, acupuncture and the Alexander technique, there are currently nine different training classes going on. Information about the training can be obtained from the brochure, which you can pick up at reception, and from the club website. There will be a chance to talk to trainers for those interested in counselling this Saturday at 10am. For yoga, etc., there will also be an informal gathering of trainers on Thursday at 4.30 p.m. So, if you are interested in becoming involved, this is your chance. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two.
Part 3 You'll hear a TV interview with Dr. Clark about global warming. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Dr. Clark, global warming was the threat of the 1980s, but it seems to have fizzled out of people's minds. Why do you think that is? Yes, in a way you're right. I think scientists have become occupied with the task of trying to find out whether it really is happening and if so, whether it's caused by human activity. A greenhouse effect is, after all, a natural phenomenon. Yes, as we know, naturally occurring gases float above us, acting as insulators that prevent heat being radiated into space. And the fear is that the insulation might get thicker. Yes, and because of this, the Earth might get warmer. The latest prediction we've heard is that temperatures will increase by about a third of a degree every ten years. What are your feelings? Well, this prediction is difficult to make. You see, the global climate is the result of a web of influences. Who is to say that a simple action such as adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere will not have several effects which might even cancel each other out? And I understand that the prediction is hard to verify, whatever. Precisely. Why is that? Because the Earth's temperature surges and subsides naturally. In fact, the best way of detecting global temperature change is to measure the temperature of the oceans as accurately as possible. And this avoids the sort of seasonal fluctuations of the temperature of land mass. Yes. In fact, an understanding of the oceans is crucial to understanding how the global climate works. The ocean transports heat around the globe. It's like a great reservoir of heat. A tiny change in sea surface temperature denotes a huge change in the amount of heat it is storing. Before you hear the rest of the interview, you'll have some time to look at questions 26 30. And now I understand you are looking at ways of refining this measurement of ocean temperature. Yes. For a long time we've measured it by placing thermometers in buoys bobbing in the oceans, and also when ships draw water through their engines. It's also been done by satellite, hasn't it? Yes. But now data from a more promising system is being collected. This is the European Along Track Scanning Radiometer, or ATSR, a much simpler name. The ATSR orbits the Earth above us. And what stage are you at with this? Well, it's been up there two and a half years now. It's an infrared detector that senses the Earth's temperature with great accuracy. And this is what we need. We have to be able to separate out random changes in temperature. I believe there are other advantages as well. There are several. Every few days it covers the entire Earth, so it produces large quantities of data. It measures the temperature from two angles, 
which allows correction for any effects that the intervening atmosphere may be having on its reading. Its field of view has a width of 500 kilometers, and it measures the temperature to 0 0.3 degrees centigrade. And it should go on for years? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Clark, for talking to us today. And now over to... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a lecture talking about flightless birds. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Yes, that's right. Our topic today is flightless birds. Do you ever wonder how flightless birds get around? By bike, plane or car? Well, probably not like that. Know more about flightless birds and find out. Flightless birds. Now, how did that happen? Scientists believe that the flightless birds evolved from birds that did fly once upon a time. They may have gradually lost their need and power for flight because they had no predators. It's a skill they shouldn't have given up, considering the number of flightless birds that are now extinct. This category includes ostriches, rears, cassowaries, emus and kiwis, but we've also included two other orders, tinamau and penguins. There are no true species of flightless birds in North America. The African ostrich, the Australian emu, cassowaries and kiwis and the South American rears are all ratite birds, meaning they lack a breastbone. Other species are known to be flightless, penguins for example, but they are not classified as ratites. On oceanic islands there are, or once were, flightless cormorants, grebes and rails. New Zealand has a flightless owl parrot called a kekapo, there is a flightless rail called a weaker. In the Falklands, there is a flightless steamer duck and there is a flightless brown teal species on Auckland Island. Long, long ago, there were dodos and orcs and the magnificent elephant bird of Madagascar. The elephant bird was nine or ten feet tall and may have weighed about 965 pounds. Can you imagine one of those visiting your bird feeder? How much does an elephant bird eat? As much as it wants to. The flightless birds of today are fascinating. The penguin does its flying under water. The ostrich is the largest bird in the world. There are some differences between flightless birds and flying birds. Flying birds usually have longer wings. As for the cross-section shape of feathers, 
the ones of flying birds are asymmetrical, while the ones of flightless birds are symmetrical. Then the number of feathers differs. Flying birds have relatively few feathers. Large feathers only grow in feather tracks to keep the weight down, while flightless birds normally have more feathers that grow all over the body. Furthermore, flying birds have well-developed keel and round breastbones, while flightless birds have greatly reduced keel and flat breastbones. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.